Trouble in this world will catch you off your guard. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. It comes so easy, but it leaves so hard. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. Well, you kneel to the Lord and you will bless yourself. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. Ain't no need to kneel to no one else. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. Hi, this is Marjan Love, and this is Marjan's Musings. And today's show is OK Boomer, an altruistic activism in a time of declining democracy. It's an awful lot. But I got some feedback that the half hour format left people wanting more. They were like, wait a minute, where's the rest of the show? And I think by the time you do an intro and an outro and opening credits and closing credits, that the 25 minute format didn't allow for an in-depth discussion of topics that interrelate to one another. So let's start with OK Boomer. My son brought this to my attention and I realized that Generation Z, which is not the millennials, it's the people that are just now becoming 20 years old, they find my generation to be stodgy and judgmental. And sometimes they are. Recently, the President of the United States ordered a strike on an Iranian general to be carried out in Iraq. I was shocked and dismayed because when I grew up, something like that was considered an act of war and required the consent of Congress. As you know, because those of you who've watched the show have heard me talk about it, my husband spent two tours of duty in Iraq, one 14 months and one 11 months. I went to the swimming pool at the Rockport Inn and Suites because it's a chalet, it's warm and lovely, and it has a jacuzzi. It's kind of my escape from the impingement of commercials and crank calls and scam calls and tweets and text messages and sometimes with the news all about the impeachment. We're now January 23, day two of the impeachment hearings. There's times I want to take my hands, put them in my hair, pull and scream, shut up. I'm done. I've had enough. And then I go online and I listen to Greta demanding that the adults of her world take the climate emergency, the environmental emergency seriously. I think about young people in my son's generation, the millennials, looking at women in my age group who spend their discretionary income on lipstick, I don't even want to tell you how much I spent for this little bottle of Immortel. It's a wrinkle removing solution. It's easy to see why young people sometimes think of my generation, which is the boomers, as superficial, self-absorbed. When we were young, 
We could buy a home. We could buy a car. A college education almost guaranteed us a job that paid well. The poor Generation Z come out of college with so much student debt, they wind up living in their parents' basement with the boyfriend or the girlfriend, who they do not marry because they're not sure that they have a future. And they assiduously use birth control because they're afraid to bring children into this world where they might not be able to feed them. I have a friend on Facebook. We worked together back in 1989. Get ready for that. That's 31 years ago. And he said, the news media wants the citizenry to be terrified, but that the world is a better place to live in now than it has ever been. And he gave a whole list of uplifting reasons why. It was kind of reassuring. And he's not a denier. He understands that when vast swatches of Australia and California are burning for months at a time in the same year as the Midwest and the Southwest are flooding. And that there's earthquakes and volcanoes that something serious is going on with our planet. He's not an ostrich with his head in the sand. There's times that I wish I could act out that metaphor. I've talked to you before about my dear friend Jenny Rengen, who is a massage therapist who does wisdom of the body. I also talked to you about conduit. They do sound healing with gongs. I have a lavender scented velvet eye pillow filled with seeds to put on my eyes to relax. And when I went to Conduit, I bought from them a thing called a mind fold. I was looking at this mask this morning as I was preparing the bags of goodies that I was bringing in to talk to you about today. And it said, Mindfold, relaxation mask, total darkness with your eyes open. And when I purchased this several years ago, I was thrilled. It has a foam cutout, and you can blink your eyes and open your eyes, and yet you're in the dark, and it was peaceful and calm and quiet, and I could focus on the sound of the bells and the gongs and the little wind chimes. I have diabetes. I've popped the vitreuses off of both my retinas. I don't see anywhere nearly as well as I did a few years ago. And this morning I thought, oh my God, total darkness with your eyes open. Be careful what you wish for, or you might get it. So, thinking of the impeachment, I spoke with the director here at 1623 Studios this morning, and I said to him, you know, no matter how this impeachment hearing works out, people will still not be happy. Who elected President Pence? How many of us would have done so? I don't think either side are going to be happy, no matter how this impeachment turns out. I was wondering, how am I going to address this in a way that doesn't just 
increase everybody's anxiety, which is already up in the stratosphere. And I went to my spiritual teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. He's a Vietnamese monk. I've talked to you about him before. On page 93 of How to Fight, he says, one arrow can save two birds. When you remove the conflict within yourself, you also remove the conflict between yourself and others. One arrow can save two birds at the same time if the arrow strikes the branch. Both birds will fly away. First, take care of yourself. Reconcile the conflicting elements within yourself by being mindful, looking deeply, and practicing loving kindness and compassion toward yourself. Then reconcile with the people closest to you by understanding and loving them, even if they themselves sometimes lack understanding. I thought that was brilliant. I was at the swimming pool the day after the United States assassinated a general of Iran. And my husband's phone is ringing off the wall, out of his pocket, his email is flooded. He's got to go to Fort Sam Houston. And I expressed my deep-seated dread and anxiety for the safety and the very life of my husband to an acquaintance of mine and discovered that she was a Trump supporter who, although she's met my dear, sweet, kind husband, and I will lay down a $20 bill on this table that she has never met President Trump. She told me, I don't care. He was a bad man and I'm glad he's dead. And all my Buddhist training went out the window and I lashed back. And when he sets off World War III, then you will care. And I turned around and I walked out of the dressing room and I got in the pool and I refused to even look at her. I did my workout, I got out, I showered, I dressed, I left and never made eye contact with her again. I was really proud of myself. I don't remember which comedian said, trying to reason with an illogical person who bases their decisions on emotions is like trying to play chess with a chicken. They fluff their feathers, walk over to you, knock all the pieces over, and poop on your side of the board. <laughs> I remembered this joke, and so I did not lash out verbally and tell her how stupid and insensitive and mean I thought she was and how I felt her hero worship was so far misplaced. I'm really glad. The humor helped me and I was able 
to look at her with compassion and understand that no matter what I said, she could not feel empathy for the fact that my husband is a soldier and might have been deployed back to the Middle East to fight a war that Trevor Noah on his show showed Trump in 2011 predicting that the current president would start a war in Iraq to get himself reelected. I found the footage deeply disturbing. And whether it's encouraging a foreign power, namely Russia, to interfere in the electoral process, or not asking the CIA to investigate American citizens suspected of nepotism and possible abuse of privilege. Trump was well within his rights to do that. He could have asked the CIA or the FBI to investigate the Bidens. Holding a foreign president hostage is a form of blackmail when you say, I will not give you money appropriated by Congress unless you do this favor for me. Dig up dirt on my opponent. Whether there was foul play or not on the part of the Bidens isn't the issue. The Constitution gives the power of financial appropriation to the Congress. I think sometimes young people look at the boomers who used to have to draw a circle with a compass and find an angle with a protractor and hand ink it on paper with a divider. And they don't understand what we're trying to tell them about developing your own manual skills, your own self-reliance. They grew up with computers but if the boomers think back, our parents parked our patoots in front of Saturday morning cartoons so that they could have time away from children to do whatever it was. And we, the boomers, as parents, were what was called doinks and dinks. Double income, no kids. Double income, one kid. These acronyms were used by the real estate people who sold us our houses when interest rates were high. But a home like mine in Rockport with a view of the ocean out the upper windows was under $100,000. The average price of a home right now in Rockport is $500,000. And income increases have not kept pace with real estate inflation. People in my generation need to understand that Generation X and Z are not living in apartments in groups and living in their parents' homes out of laziness. They're living there because there isn't enough affordable housing. I talked to you last time about Christmas 
a New Year's and because of the studio move and trying to get the servers set up and the internet stuff, you didn't actually get to see the show, which was finished on the 20th of December until after New Year's was over. But I wanted to tell you about some things that I did for New Year's. I have the potential now for a new theme song for our show from a singer-songwriter by the name of Bob Frankie. I'm going to put it on the intro and the outro. We got to see Bob Frankie on New Year's Eve. I'm going to go to Quebec. I was so thrilled when I went rummaging through my stuff and I found my English to French dictionary. It's little, it's portable. I was like, wow. And then I opened it up and I realized that with my current vision, I can't read it. And my issue is the kind that corrective lenses doesn't fix. And my husband said, don't worry, sweetheart. There's an app for the iPhone that does translation and I use it at work now with my patients who are Greek and Portuguese. I thought, wow. If it'll work for Greek and Portuguese, it'll probably work for French. I brought in my tissue box today for two reasons, actually three reasons. One, it was one of my very first quilting gifts from my girlfriend, Naomi, who made it for me to hold a type of tissues. They were called king size and then later, queen size, and then later they were removed from the market. You know, the social faux pas of making them either male and then in retrospect female. I like them because they're big and they're soft. But that was one of my introductions to quilting. And I showed you years ago my ribbons from the International Women's Writing Guild. They would take balls of ribbons that they had written on, words of affirmation, words of empowerment, words of consolation, words of comfort, and they'd knot them together, roll them into big balls, and throw them through the audience at Skidmore College. We used to be 250 strong and stronger some years. The only word I ever got twice was genuine. I was looking at my black on red and silver on green ribbons today. Every year it was a different color. One year it was lavender or whatever. But those years it happened to be red and green. And the word was genuine. And it's the same handwriting. I found that interesting. I'm listening to a CD in my car. I still listen to CDs because I'm a boomer. <laughs> it's an old Whitney Houston, and one of my favorite songs is Count On Me. I'll be there. Our friendship I will never end. I have a song that says, don't promise forever. Promise love that's real. I won't be on the planet forever. Our friendship will end. So while I'm here, I'm going to try to be honest, reliable, dependable, genuine. 
uplifting as much as I can. Hmm? So I talked to you about my fabric finds at the second glance. A lot of them were these brilliant, brilliant colors. I like this one because it was jesters and kings and queens and they're all cats. I, I got these anthropomorphic cats and I also got these wonderful, wonderful fish. I love these fish. These fish are great, you know. And then I thought, well, they're, they're kind of wild. I also got queen kitties, like, you know, these kitties that are royalty, royalty kitties. We never found Bunkin. I hate to say this, but I'm afraid he's gone. I no longer have a kitty. But I was exploring the quilting and I came across a reading this past Saturday. I am inspired by the Spirit of God, by the way, daily word. Divine creative ideas are only a thought away to know the mind of God as my own. I must open and lift up my own mind and find my connection there. I build a bridge between this outer world of form and the inner world of spirit with a single thought of willingness. I quietly affirm I am willing and I allow divine ideas to flow into me through this expanded awareness. As I feel and know my growing receptivity, I become the channel through which I receive creative inspiration. This inspiration fills my consciousness and I magnetize to myself all of the spiritual qualities of creative imagination and genius. Original bold ideas come forth with ease as I welcome the flowing energy of imagination within me. And the Bible quote that this is based on is Philippians 2, 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. There are a lot of boomers that don't go to church anymore. But most of us grew up in a world where we saluted the flag and we prayed in school and our parents belonged to a synagogue, a church, a mosque, a temple of some sort. Faith in some higher power was given in our lives and like any system that's inhabited by human beings, some people will attempt to take advantage of the system for their own self-aggrandizement, for their own lust for power and control over others. And so the church has kind of went through a rough time. I don't know that we can go back to the old ways and the old days. I don't think so. Our grandparents believed in God so much that 
they honored the expression, no greater love has any man than to lay down his life for his family, his brethren, his country. Power mongers, princes of the world, grabbed a hold of that and started wars so they could kill off the peasants. It was a form of ex post facto birth control, wealth management, land management. When one reads Machiavelli, it's very easy to become cynical about leadership and power. When I think about quilting, I think about the fact that women, up until the economic boom post-World War II, had to be frugal in order to take care of their families. And the United States was a cotton capital of the world. We grew cotton. When I was a small child, there was a study in which cotton was blamed for immolation of children, when really children had worn cotton clothing for centuries. Immolation happened when synthetic fabrics made as byproducts of the petroleum industry were used in children's clothing. And someone in that investigation set the bar for flammability so high that cotton clothing could no longer be used for children's nightwear and bedding. Cotton clothing had been used for hundreds of years. What was that about? I don't have any proof, but my gut instinct was it was because most cotton growers were people of color. Most cotton ginners that took the seeds out of cotton were poor laborers. Most mill towns were working class poor who had been driven from the farms during the Dust Bowl. Nearly all garment workers, except for high-priced tailors, were women. So in one stroke, cotton prices crashed. Farms which farmed cotton went bankrupt. Farmland could be purchased for pennies on the dollar. And great swaths of laboring poor in the United States were left jobless, landless, and homeless. I think people who were 20 or 30 years older than me, so this is pre-boom, okay? They made quilts, like this beautiful star here that I did not make. I found this in a bag at the second glance. They made quilts out of the parts of dresses that were perspiration stained prior to antiperspirants, or food stained prior to all the chemical cleaners, or worn out, they got holes in the elbows or whatever. And they took the good pieces of that fabric, cut them into shapes, and made beautiful geometric designs. 
and then they filled those shapes with batting. I was at Joanne's fabric. I touched the batting. I was like, ew, this is like nasty and greasy. And then I remembered linseed oil that I used for oil painting, but it's pressed out of cotton seeds. So of course cotton batting is greasy. It still has some of the oil in it. With the diabetes, I have this thing called neuropathy. My nerves hurt in my legs and stuff. I bought this weighted blanket. The price on it says $69.99, but I got it on a special sale. I didn't carry it in. It weighs 12 pounds. But you can't wash it. And after being in love with it for a couple of days, I realized that I got overheated under it. And in the middle of the night, I felt like I was being squashed. And I wound up throwing it off. And then I wondered, my father told me that glass is a very effective insulator. And I wondered if the reason I slept so much more soundly under this weighted blanket initially is that it shielded me from ELF, extremely low frequency radio waves. All the satellites and cell towers and cell phones and Bluetooth all emit radiation. I wondered if the glass beads and the weighted blankets insulated me from that radiation. I was at the second glance and I was looking for batting because I didn't like the $55 a twin size bed cotton batting at Joanne's Fabrics and I found this. It's a homeless disaster blanket. It's 30% wool, 70% man-made fibers. I looked at it, it's got like tinsel in it. And it says, do not dry clean or launder. Why would you give a homeless person a blanket that they couldn't launder or dry clean? Well, my glass bead blanket, you can't launder or dry clean. So my glass bead blanket, I made a duvet cover. I went to Marshall's and I got a hold of one of these fluffy, furry blankets and I sewed it in half and tucked the weighted blanket in there so that I could launder the cover of the blanket anyway, to try to get rid of shed skin cells and BO and stuff. You're like eight, 10 hours a night in that thing. I mean, how many days are you gonna wear your underwear? I mean, sooner or later, you need to wash your linen. I realized in my quilting exploration that when I was fastidious and meticulous, I could actually make a really nice, perfectly aligned quarter inch seam blanket top. And I got confident. I started like zipping along on the sewing machine and all of a sudden things weren't lining up that to make a quilt takes concentration and vision and good lighting. There are more parts to quilting than just piecing the top out of fabric to make a pattern. I decided 
that since there were no Jesus reference in any of the Christmas fabrics, I would make a cruciform shape. And then I realized that I should not have put my darkest value as the border, because suddenly the cross disappears and it sort of looks like a strange H. You learn things as you go. One of the things that I'm learning about quilting is to make the layers come together and that part of the quilting requires that you sew the backing, the fluffy stuff that keeps you warm, and the pretty top together. I went to Second Glance. I bought myself an old singer. Now, my son's girlfriend at Christmas gave me a new singer, but I bought the old one because the new one does 800 stitches a minute, and it has a top-loading bobbin which is wonderful, the old kind you're digging in underneath. But when you're quilting fabric, you're putting in a lot of stitches. The old machine, when it's running properly, does 1,500 stitches a minute. It's like almost twice as fast. So I bought this machine so that I could set it up so that when the quilt was in, I could zip along doing the quilting and I could get under the quilt and change the bobbin out without having to take the quilt out of the machine. I was in books looking at all different kinds of quilting patterns. And I copied out stitching patterns that I thought were beautiful. This one is the shell with a rope. And this one, since we're coming up on Valentine's Day, is a heart. And this one, because I bought some Japanese themed fabrics, is a wood sorrel which appears in Japanese art a lot. I wonder if it's a common planting in Japan. This one, I don't know what it's called. It sort of had a fleur-de-lis flavor to it. And there's another part of quilting. I showed you some of my books, and I told you that some of them include patterns. Well, not just the patterns to cut out the pieces, because a lot of the books have patterns to cut out the pieces. But this one book had a pattern to make a handbag. I thought, you know, a handbag is a small enough project that I might actually be able to finish it. And so on the handbag is this beautiful swallow. So I got out tools that I purchased for two different types of activities. One was my old scrap booking supplies. I have beautiful templates with razor blade cutters to make perfect circles without having to struggle with a compass and then try to go over those compass lines with a freehand razor. I mean, I own a Fisker's freehand razor, and I could do it the old boomer way with a compass and a protractor and then trace along with a freehand razor. But the innovation of a guide that cuts perfect circles every time was like, an amazing thing to me. I was like, wow, this is so much easier. And I have several of these. And the templates 
for scrapbooking when you're dealing with photos work really great for fabrics. They're circles. I have circles and ovals. And each of the colors of the cutters makes a different size in the templates. I thought, wow, I'll be able to do that. And a long time ago, I talked to you about this drawing class I was taking. Well, I bought old fashioned templates for smaller pieces. And after I had finished with the class, I thought, wow, you know, that was an investment. But one of the things you do in quilting is you do applique, which is what that swallow was for. And this talks about how to applique small decorative pieces with embroidery stitches onto your quilt so that the quilt is not only pieced and quilted together, the three pieces, but it's also got surface decoration. I thought, wow, a time when the woman of the family had enough leisure time to handcraft beautiful things for her children, her husband, her sisters. That drawing class, I bought a rolling ruler. The scrapbooking, I have grid cutting mats. I was able to form a perfect right angle square All of my purchases were wonderful. I got this kit. It's Baltimore Spring. It's laser cut appliques. And because of the diabetes, my dexterity is not very good. I mean, if I'm working with a piece that size, no problem. But this lovely design had little birds. I looked at those little bird feet and I thought, I'm going to have trouble popping them out, even though they're a laser cut, let alone stitching them down. They're tiny. And I thought about vision. You know, not just the physical vision of the eyes, but the ability to see what others see. Right now, it's winter. There's old, dirty snow outside. Like I said, Kevin and I are going to Quebec. But I kind of got sick of my Christmas quilt. Not just because I couldn't sew it perfectly, but I needed to think forward to the future with hope. When you quilt, you're supposed to have large print for medallions and medium print and then fine print. And what I bought quite a bit of was plain colors to go with the wild and crazy colors. One of the books had a pattern that I've started. It's like origami. You fold the fabric. This is one of many points that'll go on to the square. I don't think I'll make a whole blanket out of it. I'm not one of these people that can repeat the same thing over and over and over. I need more stimulation than that. So when I was at the second glance, and I had been thinking about my cutters, I mentioned them, and we're in a new studio. 
I no longer have my big blue velvet curtain. I didn't know if I could afford to buy a new fabric panel every month. And I kind of wanted to brand the show. So I bought a cricket that people use to make greeting cards, and I programmed it to write out Marjan's Musings, 1623 Studios. One of my favorite craft supply shops is going out of business, A.C. Moore. And I love cobalt blue. So I bought myself adhesive vinyl cobalt blue to cut on my Cricut because it's got a little bitty computer brain in it and it can cut for me. <laughs> But I bought it used, and the cutting blade is dull. So I'm going to have to order and pay for a new vinyl cutting blade before I can bring you in my new Marjan's Musing logo sign. We're almost out of time. But I wanted to talk to you just a little bit more about wisdom in a post-truth world. This article comes out of Unity magazine. Post-truth. I sure hope not. I sure hope that we can figure out how to be truthful to one another. I brought in the sun for you because of the beautiful cover. But even on a 55 minute show, there's a limit to what you can say. So I wanted to fess up as the fire engines go by, our new studio on Pleasant Street in Gloucester. Some people think that I'm really courageous. I showed you this music box and how you make the strips for your songs. I never made a strip with the hole punch. I was afraid I wouldn't be able to get it perfect. I've given myself a challenge. I'm going to try, even if the song doesn't play perfectly, to make some music. This is Marjan Love, and this has been Marjan's Musings. For the one who hears music is moved to the core and the one who makes music is changed evermore. But to leave here in friendship it cannot be wrong for the silence of Parting is but a rest in our song. <laughs>